welcome to Drinks Coach. Welcome to the first of two special South African Red um, deep dives I'm going to do. Today, one of South Africa's sickest tricks, world-class Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, they do it, in my opinion, better than anyone else in the world outside Bordeaux, really. Um, I think it's a real touch and go whether South Australia, uh, Australian general, grows better Cabernet. But the great Cabernets of Australia, like Kunawara from the Margaret River, from from Nuriat Per in the um, in the centre of the Barossa, these wines are on a par with those. They don't have the same prestige because they haven't been sold in the UK for as long. The exchange rates tanked over there for many many years. So what you're getting here is wines I think which are equal quality for a fraction of the price. South Africa, as I've mentioned on a couple of my other broadcasts, are in terrible shit right now because their government decided to some political manoeuvre that it would be a good idea to tell people not to drink during lockdown because it would stop rioting and it would somehow make up for the billions of pounds they've taken out of the country. Um, but uh, the fact remains that people out there who are making some of the finest wines are reaching a peak, an apogee of greatness, and finally getting world recognition for what they're doing, don't have anyone to sell their wine to. And that's a major, major flipping issue. Everything depends on cash flow. If they don't sell this vintage, they can't make next vintage. Um, if they're in Bordeaux, it's different. You know, their, their crop would be worth 50 million quid or whatever it is if they were a Pichon Barrel. Um, but it's not. Um, and nobody makes that much money out, out of wine. It's it's really a lot more about vocational love for the product. Um, so uh, without further ado, go out and buy wines. And I just want to make a few name checks at this point. And we've got... Um, Daniel Grigg from uh, Museum Wines, who's been incredibly generous to me, sending me wines. Decanter, South African wine specialist last year. Um, also, we have Gerhard Perold of Perold Cellars, also down the West Country Way. Um, Gerhard is a great grandson of the guy that invented Pinotage. I mean, we're talking about royalty here. Um, other specialists out there do do a great job with South Africa. Slurp would be a very good example. Um, but I just want to say that if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be able to do such a comprehensive tasting of regions and qualities. Um, also, timing for buying really good Cabernets couldn't be better. Uh, the red wines from South Africa that are landing on our shores now, that are available in stores right now, are from the 2017 vintage, which I've said... So Soto Voce, but I'll say it in plain sight now, it's going to be an amazing vintage. We also have a 2015 here, which was already established to be one of the great vintages. Uh, 2009 was exceptional, but you have to go quite a long way back before you find better vintages than those. So 2009, 2015, 2017 has more elegance, has more refreshment, better acidity. I think the wines will outlive the 15s by a stretch and they're not expensive wines, okay? Um, so, without further ado, let's try some wines and tell you a few stories about them. So, number one, I drank this a few days ago, forgetting that I might want to use it in this show. This is the 2019 Helderberg Winery Marks & Spencer's Cabernet Sauvignon. Pretty sure it's under a tenner. It was flipping delicious. It was so delicious. It was just like... Nah, 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 nah. It was just so easy to drink. And it just reminded me of how excited I was going to be about today and drinking these rather more um, s serious brothers of this wine. Label's lovely, which um, fair play, Hazel and all the girls out there in the wine buying team. Uh, up to your game, definitely. And I think that the wine inside is fantastic. Um, it's made by Mark Kent. Mark Kent, and we'll come on to Franschuk in a minute, started off with a vineyard, actually, which is now a car park, very close to South, South Africa's Cape Town, uh, in a place called Somerset West. And I think he only made one vintage, maybe one or two, um, of a wine called Buchenhutzkluf Syrah. And even though South Africa's been making wine for hundreds and hundreds of years, it was Mark Kent's Buchenhutzkluf Syrah that I think turned the world's attention to South Africa, going, that's South African? I would have put, I would have staked my life's reputation on it being from the Northern Rhone. The wine tastes like coat roti. For those people that have the opportunity to try 1997 Buchenhutzkluf Syrah again, I'm sure it's still drinking beautifully. Um, it's probably one of the few wines in South Africa that has real collectible collectability and value. It's almost ground zero, the Cro Magnon man of where all these exciting modern wines are coming from. Uh, but wrong variety. We're doing Cabernets today. Um, Cabernet's been grown in uh, South Africa for a very, very long time. 
I honestly couldn't work out or couldn't find out how long ago it was they started blind, planting Cabernet Sauvignon in, for example, the really old estates um, in um, Theachilech and Morgansteer, Constantia. Um, but they all grow Cabernet and they all have some very old vine Cabernet. But Cabernet generally only really came in post-apartheid. So most Cabernet plantings are from um, around, uh, whatever we're looking at, 1994 onwards. Um, but there are exceptions to that rule, and there are other vineyard, other vines which have been grown for much longer, probably because they're more suited to fortified. Um, but let's have a look at this. So don't forget that Heldenberg Winery. Um, it's like a, it's just go down to the shop um, next time you buy a roast chicken from uh, uh, Marks and Spencers or some knickers. Just pop down. This label is very easy to recognise. It's a really, really great value red. Okay, so um, let's go along uh, down the line. Uh, I think this is from Gerhardt at uh, Peril Cellars. Uh, during my Shenin blog, part one and part two of South Africa, a few weeks ago, um, I did mention his delicious old vine, Shenin Blanc, from the Pile. Um, these vineyards, although he's based in Pile, uh, this is Jeremy and Emma Borg, Swedish family. Jeremy, Jeremy Borg, and I'm half Swedish, so I'm feeling a, already a, a touch to this guy. Um, famous artist pa painting wild African dogs and wolves. Uh, and the actual brand that he has is called Painted Wolf. Um has this tiny little cellar door on Pal High Street. You can go in there, you can buy the art, you can sit there and have a taste with the uh, the lady behind the bar, who's wonderful, uh, very charming lady. Um, we'll take you through the range. Um, judging by the first wine, the Shedden Blanc, which was, I think, around £16, I'm guessing this is similar money. But this is actually not from Pal. Some of these are, one of them certainly is. Um, but it's actually from vineyards in the Bottlery Hills, which are old, old plantings in... Um, Stellenbosch, up in the hills of Stellenbosch, um, sort of like kind of southern half of... Because Stellenbosch kind of splits into the top bit and the bottom bit. Top bit, soils are very old, very porcelain-like, uh, make incredibly fine tannins. The ones in the south, a little bit more red fruit. And this is what you're going to get from here. So, Painted Wolf, The Den, 2017. My current favourite vintage. Ah. Um, all right, so if anybody wants to know what Cabernet smells like, go and buy yourself five random South African Cabernets. Nothing cheap. Don't 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 insult yourself. Um, and then amongst those five, you'll get a pretty good idea, pretty good 3D body scan of what Cabernet can do, right? So first thing I smell is the the classic French phrases, goût de capsule. Uh, we used to call it pencil shavings when we were all drinking claret and nothing else. Uh, but when you when you sharpen a pencil that smell of the slightly woody cedary wood and the smell of that slightly black graphite underneath is a smell that comes from maturing young adolescent cabernet it's kind of like a wall of dusty cedary smell like a freshly cut armoire okay but encased inside it's like it's like you open the drawer and it's just full of jars of black currant jam uh nowhere is it more obvious with the possible exception, I think, of Kunawara in South Australia. Um, but it's no, nowhere is it more obvious that Cabernet Sauvignon can smell of blackcurrants. Certainly blackcurrant jam, cassis. Um, mm -hmm. Big mouthful, we've got a lot to get through. It's adolescent, I think it needs a little longer. But it's nice. It's not overweight. It's, some of these wines are much bigger wines, much grander. This wine has some poise and it has that telltale 2017 recidity. Perfectly lovely wine. I think this needs decanting. It's under screw cap, so it probably needs to breathe a little bit. It needs to get out of the cage for a little while. Um, I just opened the bottle. Lovely. Okay, moving on. Um, now, I wanted to show you this. This is from uh, Daniel at, um, at Museum Wines. Mountain Vineyard. Uwe Mira, the Mira Cabernet Sauvignon. The reason why I'm showing you this is to... I'm, I'm trying to give you a 3D picture of what's happening in South Africa right now. And 2017 was a lovely vintage. It was a vintage after... Um, a, a year of considerable drought. Um, 2016 and 2018 were a struggle. Um, they had these big vine dams, the, the big, yeah, like kind of hydroelectric dams, which are full of water, which they depend on to irrigate their vineyards. And in 16 and worse, in 18, you could stand in the bottom and not get your feet wet. I mean, it was literally drought, 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 like a, an old. I don't know, in excess video from the 80s. Um, so here we've got Uwe Mira Cabernet Sauvignon from 2016, which was a much drier, much more arid vintage. Some people found it a bit of a struggle, and the wines were very dry, um, angry and compressed when they were younger. Uh, but the wines settled down. These wines have got are made from really, really seriously good fruit. Um, 
See, that wine's glossy, if anything. Um, you can smell it's very ripe. And if the less water you have, the more the phenolic, the red fruit ripening, black fruit ripening occurs. Um, but it stops beautifully short of being anything jammy. It's kind of compote, I would say. Mulberries, more lush, plusher than just black currants, which is quite a linear flavour. A little bit more wood treatment, I would say. There's probably more barriques used in there. Delicious wine. I think similar sort of dough as well. I was under £20, I'm pretty sure of it. But um, there or thereabouts. It's absolutely delicious. Again, um, they've managed to retain some remarkable acidity. And Stellenbosch really is one of the world's great crews for or regions for Cabernet Sauvignon. When you look at the wines from uh, Canoncot, Paul Zao, which is a Bordeaux blend. By the way, I'm doing Bordeaux blends on Thursday. I've got an equal <laughs> size of Bordeaux Merlot blends, you know, so Bordeaux star blends of Merlot, Cab Cab Franc, etc. Which I like to share with you as well. Trying to really get you guys to really get in the mood of drinking these lovely wines. And I know it's kind of weird to be talking about these dark, rich wines. Wines that normally I wouldn't pull the cork out of. I would have squirreled away and saved for Christmas. But they need to be, sh they need to be shown. People need to be shown how incredible these wines are. And while they're on, there's a lot of deals around right now. So you really want to be getting out there and buying these wines. But also, there's nothing in the world that goes better with barbecued lamb than this. And... Uh, I don't think the South can see anything else. <laughs> it's just like roadkill, uh, burvus, uh, lots of lamb chops. Lamb chops from the Karoo. Man, if you've never had a Karoo lamb chop, you ain't lived, baby. Um, they eat the nibs from the Fainboss, this unique, varied um, sort of tundra of wonderful little heathers and stuff. They take the nibs off all the little ericas, which is like a heather bush. And they might be nibbling on some proteas and some restios, some reed, reed grass. And some of them just taste like rosemary, some of these things. They're so heady. It's almost like the garrigue in France. So the lamb kind of marinades itself from the inside out. When you put the lamb chop on a barbecue, on a braai, of course, sorry, not a barbecue, the flavour is immense. Um, and they need big wines like this. Rainbow Nation, Technicoloured wines. OK, moving us on to Lanzarek. How are we doing here? 12 minutes in. This is going to be a longish one, but I think it deserves it. Um, Lanzarek. 2017, um, at a competition that I don't judge, this won a gold last year, um, uh, which is called the Michelangelo, one of the three or four uh, more, more recognised competitions in South Africa. Um, Lanzarac. Lanzarac's a name to be tussled with. Um, you can still buy wine, if you've got a few quid, you can buy collectible bottles of Lanzarac Pinotage from the 60s. A half bottle will set you back 4,000 rent, like 200 quid. A lot of money. Uh, Lanzarac, in fact, now is the most gorgeous, they had a fire a few years ago, but they've repaired re everything, gorgeous five-star um, hotel, both for tourism and for conference and everything else. And there's always been wines named after Lanzarac. And I'm not sure if it was the, the wine cooperatives of South Africa at the time that just you decided they would name it after the estate. But um, Lanzarac isn't so much an estate as a beautiful place to go and eat and drink. Um, and um, the wines have always had great reputations going back, like I said, maybe 50 years now. So, um, 2017, Lanzarote Cabernet Sauvignon. Again, from the... Um, this is from one of the really, 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 really good places to grow Cabernet Sauvignon. If you've got Stellenbosch as a lump like this, um, in the top, you've got a couple of places called Banghook and Yonkers Hook, which, where the soils are very, very, very fine, ancient soils. Um, the finer the... the, the texture of the, of the of the grapes the finer the wine ends up so um let's have a little smell of this wow quite extraordinary quite cedary again um there's a kind of a herbal lift like thyme mm. Mm. very dry very young needs more time actually uh put it into cancer for a couple of hours but wow i think the uva mirror with the extra year on it, it's got more development Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Somebody bring the buzzer downstairs. Okay, so um, quite delicious. Um, this is um Cabernet Sauvignon from Paul. Thank you, Ger Ger Gerhardt again, for this wonderful wine. Um, this is a 2014 Cabernet Sauvignon. So we're now looking at a different vintage altogether again. 2014 was quite a cool vintage. 2014, although Paul is a warm area. Uh, it was was well known for being quite cool, a bit more rain, 
more Bordelais, in fact. And the wines looked a bit skinny when they were first bottled, but now they're really expressing themselves and showing development. So for about 20 odd pounds, in fact, this is less than that. Um, at the Peril Cellars, you can buy this for about 16 95 15 95 somewhere around that ballpark. I think Slurp sells it for a slimmer money, even a pound less, but um, certainly um, I want to support what Gerhardt's doing here. Still got such a youthful colour. It's now showing what we call tertiary character. There's an almost musky undergrowth, almost, mm, almost oily, smoky smell, like like bitumen, but not in a bad way. You know that smell of sweet coal tar, something like that. Now this may well be either made by the genius young winemaker who's responsible for this range of wines. You'll see me using them all the time, Izel. But it actually, if it going back to 2014, could have been made by a guy called Johan Furry. I'm going to show one of his wines on Thursday, which is a Bordeaux blend. And he makes wines in a very cool climate area called Hermanus, um, which is right down on the windy coast where all the whales swim by. Massive golf course. When we were there doing a tasting, the whole building was shaking and howling because of the wind outside. You can really feel the cool and the slightly more frontier-like characteristics of the, of, of the climate there. Um, so it just could be a wine made by Johan. Very nice, very, very nice. Okay, now we're coming on to a wine which has um, got a lot of people chattering, actually. Um, Tim Atkin, one of the most respected wine writers in, in the world, um, does an annual review of um, the wines of South Africa, and this is a wine that actually does exceptionally well every year. Tim Atkin scored it 94 points. In Decanter, I think they scored it 96 points. I mean, these are random numbers, but I've always thought Stark Honda made absolutely exceptional Cabernet Sauvignon. This is 2017, my yummy favourite. Again, old vine, very fine vineyard, wonderful vineyard. Um, uh, the wine's aged for um, nearly two years in French oak barrels. Um, so it is designed for the long haul. And despite that, despite the fact that this wine will effortlessly walk through the next 30 years, you can drink it now, which is insane. Okay, so... Wow. In anyone's language, that's a double gold medal winning wine. It is a little bit infanticide drinking it now. Um, I get slightly emotional when I drink wine, it's good. Um, beautiful depth of fruit. Smells of mulberry layered over, cabin, uh, over black currants, over brambles. Very, very refined in the mouth. It's imperceptibly fine, the tannins. This, you know, if you've ever had the jo the joy of drinking some of the great Cabernets in Australia, let's say someone like, I don't know, bin 707, which is hundreds of pounds now, right? It used to be 15, 14.95 in my old bins back in the early 90s. Um, this wine does that. This wine is that good. It's not 300 quid, though. It's like 19 quid. I would buy that, happily lay it down for 10 years, 20 years. It would just get better and better and better. What a world-class drink for the price of a round in a dodgy pub in Wandsworth. Oh, the after Wow. Oh, my God. I'm going around to a friend's house tonight. Brennan, if you're watching this, uh, we're having this with your curry. God, blimey. Screw it. Okay, right. Just two more to go. This is Jordan. Gary and Kathy Jordan have the most beautiful estate in this beautiful part of northern Stellenbosch, just tucked around the corner from the Nietlingshof, beautiful, very old, hundreds of year old, 300 year old estate. You can look down over this beautiful hill. On one hillside, you've got Jordan and all their vineyards. On the other hill, you've got De Morgan's on making otherworldly wines as well. And they make just as many amazing whites as reds. Um, Kathy and Gary have been selling wine to businesses that I've been involved with for as long as I can remember. Um, the first wines I drank from them were um, wines when I was a buyer at Waitrose. I remember specifically the 1998 Cabernet Sauvignon, which just won everything we put into, every competition, International Wine Challenge, trophy, um, uh, decanter, trophy, bang, 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 bang. Well, they've really upped their game. They have one of the most 
visually stunning and mm, tasty restaurants in the whole of the winelands. If you ever want to go and do some tourism in uh, the Cape winelands and you go to Stellenbosch, you must stop at, um, at Jordan and Jordan's, I think that's French chef's called Jordan as well, um, winery and have lunch. Oof, what can I say? This is from the mega heralded 2015 vintage. 15 quid, by the way. 15 quid. Look at that. You just assume it's going to be 30 quid by the way of the bottle, the prestige, the fact that it's five years old and made by two of the finest cabinet experts in the land. Yeah, you see, a little bit more colour there. There's a little bit more um, sort of brick red, brackishness to the colour. Um, oh, God. I could pick that out. Um, they have a, a restaurant. I think I still have a restaurant on, just on the Thames, um, on the northern um, bank of the Thames by the Millennium Bridge uh, called High Timber, which won Michelin Star, I think. Um, and they ser serve their wines and many other great South African wines. Uh, do go down there, have some chopped up kudu, some nice bit of venison, and this is just, just made for that kind of food. What's some nice peppered biltong. They specialise in plush, and this is plush. The edges are so soft you can't feel them. It's nebulous. It's like a cloud of creme de mur. It's wonderful. Despite long ageing in woods, the wood doesn't seem that present. I think it's rather special. Yeah, I'm going to have a lot of fun tonight, I think. <laughs> I've pumped sober enough to make the next show. Um, but we shall see. Um, finally... Um, last but definitely not least, we have Haute Espoir. I don't know if any French people out there. And why is it in French? It's from Franchuk, the French hook. Tiny little bit near Stellenbosch where the French um, uh, settled after being kicked out of their own country for religious beliefs. A couple of funny things about this. Haute Espoir. Um, if you know the song by um, uh, Frank Sinatra, it does mean high hopes we've got. Uh, yeah, so High Hope, Haute, Haute Espoir, Franchuk, Cabernet Sauvignon, 2007. 2007, so this is 13 years old. To prove a point, I wanted to try this. This is also from Daniel Grigg's um, um, large seller of crazy shit, and uh, it's from Museum Wines. I love the back label. In England, we go, oh, you know, sulfites may harm your child if you choose to have a baby. On the back of this, it says, don't drink and walk on the road. You may be killed. Which is just hilarious. That's South Africa for you. And that's the reason why they can't sell the wine to anyone, because they're worried that people will walk in the road and be killed. Embarrassing, really, isn't it? But anyway, um, I think we, should, we, we could learn from that. Um, you know, there's not that many people out in South Africa, but if you're... Staggering around Soho after five Jaeger bombs. Uh, maybe this is a lesson to be learned. Okay, right. Look at that. 13 years old. Not that much changing colour. Um, at the competition that I judge, I think you can see it here, the Veritas Awards, this wine got given a silver medal. Now, uh, now without casting aspersions, you do have to get consensus on these wines. So um, if we all disagree on the score... Um, the chances are there'll be some kind of mean, there'll be an average given to it. So a silver in this situation will usually be people that don't drink old Cabernet Sauvignon, tasting the wine and going, that doesn't taste right. And other people who drink old Cabernet Sauvignon and love it, and love the development and the complexity, but, but are one of the few people that can afford to collect wine in South Africa, who probably gave it double gold. So between the double golds and bronze, it probably came out at a silver. Do you know what I get? I mean, that's the only fair way to really do it. But um, it's a bit of a shame at the same time. So this wine, I think, isn't going to be silver quality. It's either going to be a bit knackered and old, or it's going to taste fantastic. And I'll tell you which side I'm betting on. What does that smell like? The first thing that came to my head, and I have an eidetic memory for wine, was a wine called Sociondo Malle, 1985, which is a wine from the Omed Arc in Bordeaux, which is not a Grand Cru, Neither is Otis Spa. It's not one of the finer sites in the whole of South Africa, but it's also one that's super, super cult and costs Grand Cru money. They age their wine in oak because the wine's got lots of flavour, lots of concentration. So there's a lot of exotic wood character. And if I smelt this, I'd be struggling very hard to decide whether it was either elegant South African red or exotic, quite oak-punched claret. What's the alcohol level? 14.5%. That would give it away, probably. 
Well, if you're going to buy something that's 13 or 14 years old and understand why they're delicious, there you have it. That's a £40 wine. Thank you very much, Dan, for sending it to me. That was very generous of you. Fucking hell. That's, that's not going to be wasted. I promise. I promise. That might be gone by lunch, if I'm honest. <laughs> okay. It has the svelteness. Um, to just describe for those people who haven't had old Cabernet Sauvignon. When it starts off, it's very tight and quite simple in smell. A bit black currant, a bit earthy. Lots of oak. Then the wine kind of plushes out and softens. A bit like a plum in a, in a fruit bowl that just squidges a bit. And it's when that atrophy sets in that you get the most flavour. So you've got lots of primary and secondary fruits going on. Then when the wine reaches about 10 years old, sudden other things happen. The wine suddenly becomes quite svelte. It loses, like I never did. It's puppy fat. So it doesn't have the sapodginess of a teenager. It becomes quite sleek. And the sleekness is very evident in this wine. 2007, I don't, I don't think it was a brilliant vintage, but it was a cool vintage. This wine now has sleek lines, a lovely fresh acidity, um, and it's leading me down the path of anything but a new world wine. And it tastes remarkably sophisticated. The fact that all these wines, including Mr. Mark Spencer's, were all made from just Cabernet Sauvignon alone is quite special. Cabernet Sauvignon doesn't work very well in many countries. That might sound a surprise you but that's my opinion Cabernet Sauvignon needs blending normally and with the exception of some really brilliant wines in Chile some beautiful wines in Washington State the odd wine in California although and these guys you can't find better single varietal Cabernet Sauvignon I rest my case my lad see you for the blends on Thursday I'm off to get pissed cheers mm -hmm.